cleavage, which is essentially mitosis and cytokinesis. That's what cleavage is. So let's talk about cleavage. In some species, cleavage can occur over and over and over without any growth of the zygote itself. And in fact, that's the case with frog embryos, is that you will go from one large oocyte, or in this case, zygote, once it's fertilized, to hundreds of tiny cells before any of these cells will initiate the growth phases of the cell cycle. So in reality, when you look at certain organisms, they skip <clears throat> G1 and G2 phases of the cell cycle, and all they do is mitosis and then DNA replication. Mitosis, DNA replication, mitosis, over and over and over again. Now, this only occurs in organisms that have enough nutrients in the organism or in the oocyte or in the environment to do so. In cases like you and I and another species where there is, um, we actually have to get those nutrients from, you know, the mother uh, and whatnot, um, then the, uh, um, we have to go through uh, growth phases where we're taking nutrients and then get bigger and so on and so forth. So it depends upon the species on whether or not they're going to skip those early growth phases of the cell cycle initially, like in the case of the Xenopus, or whether they will take nutrients from the environment to do so. Other strategies might involve a rapid development into a larval stage in which then the larva will then get nutrients and then metamorphosize into the adult phase. So again, there's multiple strategies here. No one size fits all in terms of how cleavage occurs, which is the main point of this part of the lecture. Uh, the way in which this is typically done uh, in the frog is there are proteins that, uh, uh, mRNAs that are in the cytoplasm that get translated, and then when they get translated into this protein, they're kind of on a negative feedback loop where then they initiate something which then turns themselves off and degrades it, and then they get translated again, and then they get degraded, and so on and so forth. And they keep going through this cycle, which is why the frog embryo will go through hundreds of stages of M and S during its cell cycle before it then will, will say, okay, we're done with those hundred cell divisions. Now let's slow it down, go into the growth phase, you know, in between each of the cell cycles. So in some cases, there's just rapid uh, division of cells. In fact, it's so rapid that cytokinesis will occur even before the next round of mitosis has even begun. You get these stress folds that start going on you haven't even fully completed cytokinesis here, and it'll start dividing some more up here. You can also see in this um, embryo that the, the, the oocyte is disproportional in its cleavage. The top part is actually undergoing more cytoplasmic divisions than the bottom part, and that has to do with a number of factors. Here are the factors. Number one, the distribution of yolk. Now, not every organism has yolk. For example, you and I don't have yolk necessarily. In our, uh, but in, when you have birds and, and uh, frogs and whatnot, then again, that yolk, even fish, uh, that distribution of protein, which is the yolk protein, uh, can greatly influence whether or not cytokinesis occurs on the entire oocyte or whether it will occur in just a small portion of the area where the yolk is found. And so we're going to look at various cleavage distribution patterns based upon the yolk distribution. Now, in the case of the Xenopus, it has a very low density of yolk in the animal pole, very high density of yolk in the, in the vegetal pole, which is why you get more cell division in the top part than you do in the bottom part. The other factor that comes into the cleavage pattern of an embryo comes down to the timing and the angle of the mitotic spindle, which in many cases is predetermined by the cytoplasmic components that were put there before fertilization even began. So in some situations where the mitotic spindle starts forming, which area, for example, where's the nucleus found here? It's not actually found in the vegetal pole. It goes up towards the animal pole, and that influences the first mitotic stages and therefore cleavage stages um, of the Xenopus as well as in other organisms. Same thing is true for the, uh, for the fish and, and others. So the nucleus, we usually think of it as being right in the middle, 
It's not always the case. Sometimes the nucleus is right here in the top part where it's got a much thinner yolk. Um, and that influences the angle uh, of the mitotic spindle, where it forms, and, and all of those factors. I've already given you a prelude to it. Animal pull is reference to the low yolk area of an organism. Vegetal pull, high yolk. Now, not all organisms have this disproportion of yolk, so to speak. Again, we don't. We don't have yolk concentrations in our cells, so to speak. So these, again, predetermine the cleavage pattern of each of these embryos. Holoblastic cleavage. Holoblastic means the entire zygote. So those organisms which undergo holoblastic cleavage, like you and I, the, the whole cell undergoes cleavage. That's not the case for some organisms. Some organisms undergo what's called meroblastic cleavage, where you have the yolk, you get fertilization of the, of the nuclei, but then cleavage will only occur in just the tiniest fraction or portion of, that, uh, of the area around the yolk. That's the case for birds. That's the case for um, fish. So these are just kind of fish, reptiles, and birds. These have this meroblastic uh, cleavage also for mollusks and cephalopods, but we're not going to get into that, that one. Mainly, we're going to look at discoidal meroblastic cleavage. So for fish and birds and reptiles, they don't encompass and, and uh, undergo cleavage in the entire yolk. In fact, due to the thickness of the yolk, it can't. So all cleavage occurs superficially just on the surface and can only disproportion or, or proportion the membrane into cells that it allows. And that's why this is meroblastic. It does not, it only does a part of the yolk rather than the entire oocyte. Now, another version of this is superficial cleavage. And this is what's found in Drosophila. And the reason for that is because the yolk on the peripheral of the oocyte is very thin. So, in fact, this is why when the Drosophila undergo uh, mitosis and make all of these uh, syncytial nuclei, and then spread them out around the, the surface, it's because that's really only where cleavage can initially be produced, is on the surface, because the yolk is so thick in the middle that it can't undergo cleavage. So for Drosophila, theirs is superficial around the periphery of the yolk. It, it looks like it encompasses the entire yolk, but in fact, that middle region doesn't undergo cleavage. So that's how it works in Drosophila. They have superficial meroblastic cleavage. For birds, fish, and mammals, they have what's called discoidal meroblastic cleavage, which is just means it's on the surface. It's just on a tiny portion of the surface. For us, we're looking more at rotational cleavage right here, where, in fact, what's interesting is it'll undergo cleavage, and then perpendicular to that, the next cell will undergo cleavage. It actually goes perpendicular. And it keeps doing that. And uh, it's not just like cut in half, cut in half, cut in half. It's not like that. It is like that for sea urchins, um, where you typically have what's called radial cleavage. Radial cleavage means cuts it in half, cuts it in half, cuts it in half. Everything's, all the, the, the cells are kind of perfectly undergoing mitosis and splitting the cells up evenly, at least in the initial stages. Even though for amphibians, it is holoblastic because it does do the entire oocyte. It's what's called displaced holoblastic cleavage because it's not exactly proportional. Why not? Because of the yolk. Much thicker here in the vegetal pole than it is in the animal pole, which is a, has a much thinner yolk area. So even though it encompasses the entire oocyte, due to the yolk distribution, xenopus, or amphibians, tend to have these smaller blastomeres on the top and much bigger blastomeres on the bottom as the cells undergo cleavage. Sea urchins. Here are the three model invertebrate organisms that are used for development. Now, over the next few weeks, we're going to uh, go in depth into what are the advantages and disadvantages of using these models. What can we learn from each of these model organisms about ourselves? Because honestly, yeah, it's important that we learn about other organisms, but I'd rather learn about us. And most of the medical discoveries that we have, a lot of them come 
from learning about these invertebrate model organisms. We learn quite a bit. In fact, C. elegans was one of the first organisms that we uh, sequenced its entire genome before almost any other. And we learned quite a bit from that sequencing of its genome. Um, so, C. urchins, C. elegans, these are a worm, and Drosophila, the fruit fly. These are three invertebrate models that are used quite substantially. Now again, sea urchins, these have radial holoblastic cleavage. In the initial stages, they pretty much have the same divisions. It's, a, it's along the same axis, and it keeps dividing them. Now, over time, eventually you start having these macromeres. These are much larger cells, and you have these micromeres up here, actually mesomeres, and then the small under here, micromeres. You can see how it's not like clear cut and dry, even in this situation. Initially, all the cells are about the same size. And then you start getting into some subdivisions where these will undergo more rapid mitotic phases, and these uh, not so much, and then you'll end up developing these even smaller cells. Notice the fate mapping here. What do you notice different about the fate mapping here than you do in others? They're not in order. Typically, in other organisms, you have ectoderm, mesoderm, endoderm. The reason for that is in the gastrulation events or the movement of the cells, these cells will invaginate and move inward and eventually form the second layer. So even though they are found here, you know, you'd be like, well, why aren't they in the three layers as they should be? It's because these will actually move inward and become that middle layer that becomes the muscle and things of that sort. So this one's fairly unique. C. elegans. What's fascinating about C. elegans, they have an exact number of cells. I mean, every time it's like 1,000, I'm trying to remember what the exact number is, but it's like 1,079. They count it every time, and there is the exact same number of cells every time that this organism develops. It's just fascinating. This one has, similar to you and I, rotational holoblastic cleavage. One of the things I want to point out here, after the very first cell division, these cells are already pre-established autonomously to become the germline cells. And it's just fascinating that they already have the maternal components to develop autonomously into the germline cells. So this will split, and then the cells, the, the, the mitotic spindle. Here's an example of the, where the position of the mitotic spindle matters. The mitotic spindle will shift, and then the cells will split. And then it'll shift, and they'll split. That's why it's called rotational holoblastic cleavage is the entire oocyte will undergo cytokinesis, but every time it does, the mitotic spindle formation will shift and then split, and then it'll shift in each one of those cells. Drosophila is, remember, syncytial meroblastic. Meroblastic because it doesn't uh, uh, split all of the cytoplasm or the yolk. It only undergoes cleavage in the peripheral. So this is a superficial cleavage. All this middle area right here, this is the yolk. This is the nutrients that the Drosophila needs in order for the cells to undergo their growth phases. And as they're moving around, they take the nutrients as they need it. But it is meroblastic and superficial because the periphery of the yolk is where it has the lowest density of that, which is why that's where mitosis and cleavage will essentially undergo is in that outer region.